Five down, two to go. This is the critical thinking lecture on causality, aka figuring out what makes what happen. This is probably my favorite uh, section of the critical thinking unit and probably the most important thing I learned from my philosophy major. Um, I, um, I can't wait to break the bad news to you. All right, but first things first, it's essential that we are able to tell the difference between causation and correlation. And this is the essential problem throughout all of science. When you take statistics, this will be also the big issue, distinguishing between what is just a correlation and what gets the gold standard of causation is everything. So a correlation simply describes a consistent relationship between two things. A lot of times when I see correlations, uh, or the word correlation being thrown around in essays and the like, um, you guys usually mean that the connection is stronger than what the word usually entails. And really it only means that whenever X happens in a certain way, then Y happens in a similar or a different way. So when X increases, Y does two, or maybe it decreases, or when X decreases, then Y does two. All it means is that when X consistently moves in one direction, Y does also, or it moves in the opposite direction, but it's a consistent uh, movement that occurs between two things. Um, so examples of correlation might be generally students with higher grades like school more, uh, twice as many accidents occur when you are close to home, whenever I'm around my grandmother, I'm tired. And there's lots of ways that we can explain these things. For instance, it might be that students who enjoy school get better grades because they're having fun and paying more attention, or it could be that you'll like school if you get better grades because you'll find, uh, feel like you're doing a good job. So maybe it's the grades that are making you like school more, or maybe it's the liking of school that makes you uh, get better grades. It's tough to say which is doing the, uh, the doing here. Another instance might be uh, you know, the, the accidents close to home. It might be that you are more careless in a familiar neighborhood, or it might be that you are close to your home more often than anywhere else. That's another possible explanation. Uh, whenever I'm around my grandmother, I'm tired. Hanging out with Granny might be exhausting because of the long drive, the story she tells, the food she serves, or the fact that she makes you realize that you will grow old one day and die. So because there's lots of ways to explain these correlations, these connections, we're not able to give them the gold standard of causation quite yet. So causation is a more specific type of relationship between two things, when one thing is what makes another thing happen. Y happens because of X. So if you look at examples of causation, I get good grades in school because I study and do my homework. I grow big muscles because I work out all the time. I'm tired at my grandmother's house because she is slowly poisoning me. Right? So. Let's take a look at this instance uh, and see if we can parse out whether or not it's causation or correlation. Uh, this is a fact in a lot of cities uh, in the country. Areas with strongest, the strongest anti-gun laws have the highest rates of crime. So is that causation or correlation? Is one causing the other? All right. So it's correlation. It might be that strong gun laws increase crime, which is what a lot of gun rights advocates uh, proclaim. Or, more plausibly, it might be that places with higher crime need stricter laws. Uh, president Obama became president and the economy crashed. It's a correlation the recession occurred due to numerous causes that started well before Obama's presidency. And this is going to happen all the time when you are watching political debates or seeing attack ads. Whoever's in charge is essentially responsible for everything that happened which isn't exactly fair, it's pretty misleading most times. For instance, um, the economy recovered and we got more jobs under President Obama, but that doesn't necessarily tell us whether or not uh, somebody else could have done a better job. I mean, perhaps President Obama was the worst aspect of the entire equation, and almost anyone else would have uh, allowed the economy to speed up at a faster rate, and more jobs would have acquired, uh, you know, been acquired. Um, and so... Just because you're there and the guy in charge or the gal in charge doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you're responsible for everything that sort of happens on your watch. And so oftentimes politicians will be blamed for whatever happened while they're in charge, but usually it's just correlative. 
the water level is rising because icebergs and snow are melting. Correlation or causation? Well, it's that big fat because right there, which makes it causation. The water level is rising because of more ice melt. Without this melting, the water level would not be rising as much. So the two fallacies of causality that we're going to learn are the post hoc fallacy and the slippery slope fallacy. And by far, the post hoc fallacy is the more important one. That's the one that connects with our discussion of causation and correlation. So this is one of those fallacies where you're actually going to want to know it by name, along with the straw man fallacy and a few of the others. Um, so the post hoc fallacy is short for post hoc ergo propter hoc, which means after this, therefore, because of this in Latin. Which basically means X happened after Y, well, Y must have caused X then. Yeah. Um, and it's a fallacy where you inappropriately identify the cause. So more often than not, this fallacy is going to occur uh, when you are confusing a correlation for causation. So there's this causation that, or correlation that occurs, and you think it's actually a causal connection. And the classic example that always gets used is one with a rooster and the sun rising. The rooster crowed and the sun rose, therefore the rooster caused the sun to rise. Uh, another example might be, every time I drink Gatorade, I win a game. Therefore, Gatorade causes me to win games. So when someone proclaims that's a post hoc fallacy, which is often used because this is one of those few fallacies where people actually know it and cause it by name, uh, call it by name, uh, they're essentially saying, eh, it's just a correlation. We actually don't know that one thing made the other happen. Now the other fallacy is the slippery slope fallacy, but before I can define what the slippery slope fallacy is, I need to define what it is not. And so a slippery slope fallacy is not a true causal chain. And by chain I mean we're talking about like one domino making another domino, making another domino, making another domino fall. An instance of a true causal chain would be if hanging out with certain friends means that you will do heroin and doing heroin disqualifies you from joining the FBI and your goal is to join the FBI, then you shouldn't hang out with those friends. This is true. This is the true causal chain. If A leads to B, B will lead to C, and if C is bad, then you shouldn't do A. So this one domino will make another domino, which will make another domino fall. Okay. The slippery slope fallacy occurs when you think there will be a causal chain when there won't necessarily be one. So if you don't do your homework today, you'll end up poor and alone I guess presumably, presumably because you'll be ignorant and uneducated. Another example of the slippery slope fallacy would be, if we let the communists take over Nicaragua or El Salvador, pretty soon they will be in other countries like Guatemala and Honduras. Uh, soon all of Central America will be communist. This is a famous quote from Ronald Reagan in his explanation of fighting communism in Central American countries. So what makes these slippery slope fallacies? Well, it is possible that not doing your homework today is the first step towards ruining your life, but it's also possible that you do makeup work, get good grades, and lead a happy life. So essentially the question is, do the dominoes need to keep falling? Will they stop? The whole phrasing behind the slippery slope is that if you take one step onto this muddy, slippery slope, you know, the slippery hillside, you're going to fall all the way down. So just taking one step onto that hill is going to make you fall all the way down. And so a lot of times, you know, the slippery slope is a matter of opinion. It's a matter of do you think one thing actually will cause the next, the next, the next, the next thing to happen. Um, so when you say that's a slippery slope fallacy, you're accusing someone of saying the dominoes are going to keep falling when you don't think they actually will. So... As historically we saw, uh, just because some places in Central and even South America became communist did not mean that it spread across the world like a disease. It is po possible that communism will, will spread, but it's also possible, and in fact happened, where it stayed localized, and it didn't affect other countries. Let's take another look. Slippery slope or true causal chain. First we gave several days off at Christmas, then we agreed to sick days, then we were talked into a day off. If someone got married, pretty soon they're going to want Earth Day declared a holiday, and eventually they'll ask for a day off to celebrate their bird's birthday. I tell you, we should have stopped with Christmas. It's a slippery slope. Just because we have Christmas as a holiday doesn't mean it will lead to those crazy conclusions. We can just have a few days off, and it'll stop there. That seems pretty plausible to me.
If nobody recycles, then landfills will grow and pollution increase. If pollution increases, then your children will be raised in a dirtier, less healthy world. If you want to improve the planet for your children, then you should do your part and recycle. This is a slippery slope or a true causal chain. That's a true causal chain. By not recycling, you are increasing long-term pollution, even if only a little bit. Now, if it claims something greater, like if you don't recycle today, it's going to cause global warming and destroy the planet for everybody. That would be a slippery slope, just because you by yourself cannot destroy the entire planet. Um, if maybe we added in uh, more delicate verbiage, like if you don't recycle today, you're going to contribute to destroying the planet, then yeah, that seems more probable. The slippery slope is when you know one person claims that you're going to lead to these outlandish conclusions, when that doesn't seem to be the case. So these are the two fallacies of causality, post hoc and slippery slope. And as a final thought, just to trouble you, um, I wanted to show you some sort of spurious correlations, which are kind of fun. So this is something that I highly recommend that you look up, but essentially uh, some correlations uh, that are kind of funny, uh, are you know, some of these connections. Like for instance, um, in the years when Nicolas Cage had more films, that's also, uh, those are also years where drownings in pools occurred at a higher you know, rate. Um, when the number of people who died uh, entangled in their bed sheets increased, it actually happens a fair amount in the country. Those, those, are, those are shocking numbers. Uh, we also eat more cheese. Uh, coincidence? Probably. I mean, these are both shocking numbers. 800 deaths per year. 33 pounds of cheese on average per capita. These are scary things. But anyway, uh, I highly recommend you look at these up. They're pretty funny. Um, divorce rate, amount of margarine uh, consumed. Anyway. Um, and the reason why we have these graphs is because this is actually a typical strategy of scientists. What they will do is they will throw a whole bunch of variables uh, onto graphs and just sort of see which ones kind of connect, which ones have similar you know, troughs and peaks and see if they can kind of come up with a causal connection themselves. However, these ones are, of course, absurd. Um, and so that tells us that, you know, correlations don't, by themselves, no matter how closely they might be followed, these correlations by themselves don't prove causation. And that's sort of the next bit of bad news that I've got to get to. So how do you know perfectly? How do you perfectly know what caused what? You can't. All causal claims at their heart are probabilistic. You can never say in a foolproof way that one thing caused another, only that it seems very probable. So this discussion of like sort of probability uh, probably reminds you uh, of our discussion of induction. And that's exactly the issue, is that all causal claims, all you know, claims to knowing that A caused B are going to be inductive in nature. You see things happening over and over again, and you sort of develop these sort of patterns of, okay, whenever I put my hand in a boiling water, it seems to hurt, therefore it's the boiling water that hurts my hand. You know, you're, you're coming up with these inductive claims, but as we know, inductive claims are only probabilistic. They're never 100 to 100%. Um, and to prove that, David Hume, my main man, favorite philosopher of all time, um, has this really famous and troubling thought experiment. It's not even a thought experiment, it's just an example. And he explains that when you see one billiard ball hit another, making it move, you really see two separate events at two separate times. You see one ball hit another, and then you see a second ball move. But you really don't see the causality connecting the two balls. For instance, we can explain the ball moving other possible ways. Maybe there's magnets under the tables, or there are sort of remote-controlled billiard balls. The fact is that we can imagine other possible explanations, and they're not, well, they are actually a little crazy, but they're not impossible. And because they're not impossible, and because there's multiple ways to explain them, they're still just sort of correlations like anything else. So really what David Hume tells us is that we never for sure, for sure, for sure know causality. However, um, that doesn't mean that we can't use the term causality in a normal way. Even David Hume said, I can't go around my life acting like my brakes won't stop my car. That's no way to live my life. And so I only throw this in there to show that at a very deep level, causality is a little troubling. But we can still use the term in a sort of normal, everyday way, so long as we can distinguish it from correlations, which are very different. All right, that's causality and causation.